that wasn't perfect, uh, but I wanted to start with that. That is Mozart's Kirschel 279, Sonata in C. So this will be a discursive talk again, a walk and talk. I do like the walk and talks. Seems like thoughts flow a little more freely when you're walking. A number of great philosophers have thought the same. So I'm gonna take a drink. And I'm not sure how um, discursive this is actually gonna be. I might go back later and edit out some parts. There's extended silence. All right. April 7th, it's a nice day. Maybe I wanted to start by talking about extremism. There has been a tendency away from extremism on the right wing in the past year. Really, the beginning of 2018 was the last hurrah for the old school um, Wignat. And since then, I think we've been gradually realizing that we need something a little more fundamental than just an assertion that we need an ethno state or something like this. It's, it doesn't matter if you want it, it matters if uh, it's actionable. And something like that is simply not actionable, which is why I've talked recently about setting up communication networks, some kind of academic system. And there are a number of uh, paths that we could take. One I've been thinking about is a book club, essentially. Just talking about like the great philosophers, because I believe what's necessary is really some kind of foundational system. We need, um, you know, more than just history. We need to actually get into, in a technical sense, the history of philosophy. And we could start with Pythagoras because he's actually very relevant. People generally don't know that Plato was a Pythagorean. Plato's unwritten doctrines, which Aristotle talks about and which other sources uh, corroborate, were essentially the Pythagorean notion of the generation from unity. There is the monad and the dyad. There's buffalo over there. I don't know if you can actually see them. But the Pythagoreans treated this in kind of a metaphysical way as the essence of number, but the monad is not the same as like the functional number one. Hopefully you can see him pretty well. Not the same as the functional number one, but a higher order principle underlying it, allowing for the potentiality of numbers. The dyad would be uh, an indefinite multiplicity. And I talked about this in my Metaphysics of the Perennial Philosophy series in the first video as order and chaos, essentially. So Pythagoras had a big influence on Plato. Plato had a big influence on Aristotle. Aristotle was, for the most part, a Platonist. He criticized a few points. He clarified his interpretation of the doctrine of the ideas. But, um, yeah, at heart, that tradition originating with Pythagoras is responsible for all of the learning of the ancient world, for the most part, the ancient Greek world. Euclid would not have existed if it weren't for Pythagoras. The Greeks uh, practiced arithmetic by laying down pebbles in various shapes, and they learned the properties of different numbers. Uh, they talked about square numbers and oblong numbers by virtue of how the pebbles ended up being laid out in the, the different kind of diagrams that they would use for their calculations. 
and you can see this as similar to the abacus method but obviously the greek system was more adaptable it wasn't as rigid and this same tradition of uh of counting with pebbles effectively is the beginning of computing with the antikytherian uh mechanism which was likely produced in syria if you look at the beginnings of the neolithic a lot of the early stuff is in syria it's a very very old culture and there were a number of greek geniuses from syria syria uh Poseidinius, who is a polymath in um and i think he was also familiar with Platonism. Uh, I don't know too much about his writings. I'd like to get to them at some point. There was Nicomachus of Syria, Nicomachus the Pythagorean. The Pythagorean school exerted... Okay, so I was gonna walk down there, but they're doing <laughs> construction. So. Um, that's actually a really nice place to walk, but it's a public uh, reservoir, so... Sometimes they have stuff going on there. Oh well. Now I gotta rethink how I'm gonna do this. I'll walk this way. And hopefully the wind is not too bad. I have a, a lapel mic under my shirt and it has some one of those little foam things over it. So hopefully the shirt combined with that does effectively keep out the wind noise. But yeah, so I think a lot of people want to jump to contemporary philosophy or 20th century, 19th century philosophy. And if you don't have the full heritage, if you're not familiar with the scholastics even, then you're not in a position to evaluate the broader developments in Western thinking. And if we want to know who we are now, we do have to know that heritage because our thoughts are a direct result of that philosophical tradition. Even if you're not interested in philosophy at all, it still impacts your worldview. Uh, in a sense, the definitions that we have of words, the words that we possess, the concepts that we use, are in large part originated through philosophy. So some kind of systematic going through of the great philosophers, starting with um, the Pythagorean source book and library. Obviously, Pythagoras didn't leave written records because he, like Plato, believed that the core doctrines, the essential components, can't be set down in writing. They're something that you grasp intuitively or you don't and not on first hearing. You have to go through a long process of initiation and learning the mathematics and this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, eventually. Eventually it comes down to whether or not you possess this kind of innate faculty of the intellect, which isn't implausible that some people would have access to a kind of intuitive mechanism that others don't possess. Um, and that's, I'm going to go way out in left field here and say that that is possibly related to parapsychological aptitude. Because lately I've been noticing consciously all of the things that I am capable of sensing. Uh, and I've noticed others as well. Children are sensitive to this. Animals are sensitive to this. Many people observe a pet kind of understanding one's intention before carrying out the action. Like when I have a cat to keep away the mice. Um, and so when I go to get a treat for my cat and I start walking towards it, the cat will just run right up and follow me knowing what I'm going to do, even if it shouldn't be by context obvious. And... So there's also with my daughter, who's two, almost two and a half now, 
and she will sometimes say a word that I'm thinking and that's very hard to explain and it's happened multiple times so the idea is that you can't just write down these things the like the esoteric within the wall doctrines because to really transmit them you need the living presence of a teacher and some of that transmission will be other than declarative language or even body language there's some kind of direct communication that I think is required. Uh, so in the classical world around the time of Pythagoras, there were three, not competing, but coexisting systems of soteriology. One, the Orphic being a, a way of ordering life in religious terms, structuring how one lived um, and receiving salvation through religious rites. Now, Pythagoras was influenced by Orphism, shares several of the Orphic beliefs in common, like reincarnation, but he didn't believe in salvation through religious rites or magic. Well, I mean, sort of magic in the actual Persian sense. Yes, magic. But uh, he believed in salvation through this kind of deep comprehension, intellect, philosophy, seeking after the truth. And then the third was the mystery school tradition, which it seems like from everything that I've read about it was probably essentially like a drug based cult. So you would have the, um, the, what's the name for it? The prophetesses who would receive messages in a trance like state. And then the priest would uh, communicate that. So the mystery schools probably acted also in intelligence capacity and maybe there was some kind of international coordination by some kind of elite peace, uh, priestly class something like that related to the mysteries but more directly insofar as you interacted with it if you were initiated you probably took a drug maybe mushrooms maybe the gas that came out of these kind of volcanic mountains uh, but you had a dramatic experience that reshaped your worldview and then you were told essentially like the essence of perennialism which is like your personality your mortal form is only one of infinitely many appearances that you will assume that ultimately the underlying being behind you or i or anyone else is this same um, impersonal absolute or even divine feminine in a certain sense. So, and being, having just had some kind of dramatic hallucinogenic experience will um, make you more susceptible to receiving those kinds of ideas on faith. Whereas Pythagoreanism, Platonism, were more interested in like building your way towards that understanding. And who knows how far back the idea of immortality goes. Some people, like the generative anthropology crowd, would say that it goes back to the beginning of language, where for the first time, a sign has a kind of uh, eternality that physical things don't possess, because you can continually call back the sign that referred to the original object. How you doing? Uh, without the object being there. So the sign has this kind of um, formal, eternal quality. It's the introduction of the platonic realm into human action. And this... <clears throat> this may be the beginning of the belief in immortality. It can, you can see how it would follow if you came to believe because of language that the things to which we refer are instantiations of a type, then you can believe that what you are is one instantiation of a type. And if you identify with the type rather than the individuality, then uh, yeah, you are immortal in a sense. And really that just depends on you know how you consider your identity. 
I have my own thoughts, but people can very well uh, identify with a particular set of features inherited genetically, a certain mode of thinking that's culturally transmitted, and as a consequence of that, believe that they share in the immortality of their people and culture. And that's at least more respectable than atheistic hedonism, where you don't believe in any kind of higher form or universal ordering principle to things, and you're only concerned with what you can experience as a person, as an individuality. But my kind of interpretation of identity is more that there is a factual continuity of experience which is something like a linguistic structure because it's possible to read through uh, your experience in terms of some kind of common language of experience that also relates to the Pythagorean notion of the one and the many the uh, the one underlying the multiplicity and so there is a oneness to consciousness in its continuity so that is an objective or I guess subjective basis for identity as far as the soul is concerned that I think you can't really coherently reject it and if that's your definition then you can't just fall back on uh, the continuity of your cultural tradition if you want to justify immortality if you want to call yourself mortal you would have to say that the actual continuity of experience uh, in fact continues the Orphics believe this the Pythagoreans believe this Plato believed this and I don't know about Plato's personal opinion on reincarnation he probably believed in it you can see in some of the dialogues where they're arguing about what happens after death and someone in one of them at least um, does put forward reincarnation and the counter argument to it is just very weak and Plato wrote his dialogues uh, he says in the letters that this the, all the dialogues are basically just restating teachings of Socrates and that his own true doctrines are not publicly accessible through writing. And this isn't a form of esotericism like a secret society where it's intentionally withholding knowledge. It's just operating under the understanding that if he were to publish uh, what he's able to conclude based on this philosophical way of life and the, the direct intuitions and perceptions that leads him to, that if he were to express that publicly, it would just be incoherent. It would foster uh, jealousy, animosity, and uh, confusion, and just wouldn't help anybody. So that's why you keep that stuff secret. And in that vein, I mean, my Metaphysics and Perennial Philosophy series I made because I found that I couldn't set down my position in writing. I'd like to at least try. It will necessarily be imperfect but uh, I spoke at length about it because that gets at more of the other kinds of communication that we use, but without another individual there to whom I'm actually giving this information, I can't craft my signs to actually bring about a change in state of the other person. I can only operate on a kind of generalized model of who would be watching. And that's really just not good enough. You do need direct personal conversation. So I'll move on then and just say, going back to this academic or communications network idea that we need more one-on-one -on -one conversations. Group conversations are better than just watching videos and commenting, but they also have a kind of theatrical aspect and inherently the dynamics of hierarchy uh, make their way in there. I'll wait until I'm past the bridge. So you end up with a lot of political charge to the interaction and this distracts from pure considerations of understanding and knowledge 
and then also just the inherent structure of having multiple people vying for the mic, so to speak, uh, distracts from like a coherent line of thought because you have different thoughts coming in from all angles, upsetting the narrative that's being crafted and the narrative ends up being discursive. If you ever engage in ordinary conversation, people are absolutely willing to change topics at any point. This always bothered me when I was a kid because when someone would bring something up, I would go into an analytical mode in order to understand the meaning of what they're saying as much as possible. Uh, <laughs> but this is not how people operate. And so I would always end up being confused. Like you were talking about this. Now you're talking about this. There's, I don't feel a sense of resolution in any of this. And I don't think that's me just being awkward and, and antisocial or unusual in a pathological sense. I think it's just that people are not concerned about truth, not concerned about understanding. Their purpose for communicating is not to inform, but rather to satisfy instincts of sociality. Um, so you have to tap into those instincts, use those instincts for productive purpose. That's what Pythagorean society was meant to do, their communal structure. They didn't always live together. Some of them did but there were norms and a common ethical code and that and necessarily ways of structuring discourse that allowed a greater harmony. I don't think I've ever walked down this road. So finding that harmony is significant and that is the Pythagorean resolution of the monad and the dyad. You can look at it in terms of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God being the one in an unlimited sense. The Son being the dyad, the potentiality of difference, which necessarily must be uh, iterated in terms of some kind of logical structure. If we say that there is a difference, then we're saying that there's a common syntax in which that difference is intelligible. That's Chris Langan's principle of syndifianesis. I pronounced it wrong last time. Um, and I think it's a significant thing to keep in mind. That's why I've reiterated it three times uh, across several videos. But what was I saying? Uh, yeah, harmony. Uh, the Holy Spirit would be the harmonizing of the one and, uh, and the two, or the multiplicity. This has very much to do with my notions of the infinite and the finite and their relations. My philosophy has been based on this. I didn't realize that I was reiterating Pythagorean thinking. Uh, it was just what made sense to me. And I noticed that my own beliefs coincided with that of Advaita Vedanta. And so I started getting interested in Advaita Vedanta. But all of this has been motivated by my own philosophical understanding that I based off of what I could see in physics and then my own kind of common sense. But anyway, we need harmony uh, in order to have discourse. Discourse facilitates this understanding. There are a few autodidacts out there who operate better on their own, but the majority of people are not, even if they think they are. Most people need to talk about what they're learning in order to really retain it. So if this can be done, it doesn't have to be done in terms of a history of philosophy discussion group. I just think that has certain inherent advantages that are worth considering. Uh, but to start with, probably just discussing worldviews, discussing, you know, your perspective on our common political scenario. That's one large impetus to philosophy that I didn't talk about in the last video. There's a shared political context that requires us, because of shared interest, to address shared threats. And, and so this kind of discussion goes on all the time without necessarily getting down to lower level, more fundamental principles uh, that would attempt to describe or define threat and incentive and good and bad. 
without discussing ethics, you can't really coherently harmonize your political thinking. It can only be done in a pragmatic way with ethical presumptions latent in it. Um, but yeah, so I'm setting up an email list. I already have a few people on it. You can uh, message me on Discord if you want me to add your message me your email address, one that you don't mind others seeing within that group. And uh, probably I would like to vet. So if you want to participate, you'll want to talk with me first and get approved basically to participate. And this is because we have people who want to subvert any kind of uh, you social behavior in these spheres who are not from these spheres. We do have people doing that all the time, especially on Discord. So it's just an unfortunate fact of our political reality. Yeah, set up, set up an email list, uh, sort discussions to take place on a weekly basis so you'd basically be assigned one person to talk to and we'll rotate this so that everyone talks to everyone else. This is a long-standing belief that I've held about organizational structure. Like in church, what are we supposed to do in church? What's the function of church? To instill good morals, right? To get us to recognize our sin, our shortcoming, shortcomings, and um, and overcome them, express charity, express agape, universal love. And how do we do that in church? We all sit and listen to somebody with a, a degree, an approved degree, uh, or who's like been ordained by an approved organization. We listen to them express their thoughts and interpretations of a tradition which is better than nothing, and that's probably a necessary component. Lectures are necessary, but you're all in church. You're supposed to love one another, and yet the discussion is disorganized. What would happen in a church if you set aside like 10 minutes and randomly sorted people to talk to one another and understand one another's hardships and joys and directly resonate with them? You get this over a long period of time, that's true, people naturally begin to talk, but some people who are valuable, who would benefit the social climate are just not the kind of people who are going to initiate a conversation. There are people who are just antisocial by nature, and then there are people who are too good, essentially, to be interested in disrupting someone's, someone else's way of thinking or like their, the balance that they have in their lives. Uh, the best people in a perennialist conception are the ascetics and they don't voluntarily engage in society because they understand a kind of futility in it and they also understand that them working on their own special moral place will have a greater benefit to society than trying to take up the position of, of the socialite and exert this kind of social influence to benefit virtue. For them, the direct practice of virtue is seen to be uh, an individual endeavor by and large, except in monastic communities. But still, in today's age, the people who are uh, you know, born to be that, to be that type, are generally not that type. They might play some strategy game on the computer addictively or fall into other vices um, and or they join monastic orders if they're of religious sentiment but the thing is the religious orders that exist are not based on reason they're based on a suspension of philosophy that's why i have a problem with mainstream christianity including catholicism even though i go to catholic mass because effectively with the dogma you say this is the answer to this metaphysical question no more thinking about it. And that's not a love of wisdom. That, that, so that's my critique of Che Dyer's approach. He says that his orthodox system is coherent and it explains the world, has explanatory power and it's coherent. Uh, and so we're, we are justified in being satisfied with it. I'm not satisfied stopping philosophy because there's always a chance that you're wrong 
you can believe that what you have is inspired. You can point to different evidence to suggest that your tradition is the one true tradition and like cling to faith in it. But you can't really ever know ultimately if a given human institution is inheritor of, of truth, of Logos directly. So I'd rather continue philosophy. And yeah, we have to talk about it, get in a group, discuss one-on-one, -on -one, and then other formulations to follow. If you watch my uh, join our experiment organization video, this described a kind of academic model that we did try out. It had certain benefits, but it was too much too soon and overwhelming. And uh, what we really need is just to practice communicating with one another and start harmonizing in a natural way our thinking. As it stands, people will gravitate towards those who are already like-minded or who they just naturally resonate with. And that's fine on a voluntary basis, but you're not getting a lot of synthesis of thought that would otherwise leave, lead to a harmonization of our thinking. We want to harmonize our thinking with each other and with the natural law. If you stay by yourself, unless you're one of those rare geniuses that was just born to do the ascetic route, um, unless that is who you are, being part of an intersubjective community, all aspiring to align their thinking with the natural order, uh, you're going to do better. So that natural order um, I've described in the past as a product of the anthropic principle. If the one ultimate principle is simply infinity, a lack of all limits, then every kind of limitation will have to be present in a local sense, none of which are absolute, but each of which are necessary to fill up the infinite nature of this one principle. So basically, you can think of it in terms of one undifferentiated consciousness underlying infinite varieties of perspectives on it. And if that's the case, then you will necessarily find yourself in an ordered universe insofar as that order is necessary for the form of cognition which you represent. And it will be continuous insofar as your experience is continuous. So there is a kind of anthropic justification for a localized natural order, but uh, there are antinomies regarding that first principle. If it must be infinite, then it can't be finite. Otherwise, it violates the law of identity. And so by asserting this unlimited as the first principle, you're already uh, invoking the metalogical laws. You're already invoking a kind of natural order. But if this thing is supposed to be the first thing, then you can't take it as an object subordinate to a higher syntax. Otherwise, it ceases to be the first principle. So to preserve it as the first principle, you have to say that it is essentially as the classical theists conceive of God, a necessary being. Because let's go back to rather than, you know, is reality at base monistic or dual? Is it at base, base uh, unlimited or limited? Let's ask a question, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? Is it possible that there could have been nothing? Talking in those kinds of terms, uh, refers to nothing as an object within a higher syntactic structure. Nothing is intelligible to us in its opposition from something or everything. And so it may be there is a kind of only way that reality could possibly be a self-generative natural law that is embodied in this singular undifferentiated one principle of the unlimited, of the infinite, all-powerful. Uh, because if it were to have multiple components, multiple, if the natural law didn't reduce to a kind of unity necessarily, then 
each individual natural law would be related, again, in terms of some kind of syntax in which their differentiation is intelligible. And so you would be making reference to a higher unity underlying the multiplicity of the natural law. And this same structure comes out when you talk about, in Pythagorean terms, the monad generating the dyad, or their combination generating the other numbers, everything inherently possessing numerical quantities. And this is pertinent to the study of numbers, you know, number theory. What are numbers? If you don't give it a metaphysical dimension, you're just choosing not to look at that side of the question. Because no matter what kind of metaphysical system we posit, number is already implicit. If we say that there's one God and one created world, well, there you go. You have two things, creation and God. And that two, <laughs> what's its origin? Everything that we can think of has number embedded in it. That's one of these natural laws. Everything also has this kind of logical necessity flowing from the metalogical laws. And what's its basis? Well, if we say that the one in numerical terms, um, or in Pythagorean terms, is the basis of multiplicity in number, we can say also that that one is the basis of the law of identity in logical structures. Because it's the one necessary being, it can't help but be the case that all identities are preserved. Because if any identity were to be violated, then this would uh, represent a limit on the unlimited, which is this just necessary being, it must exist. I know a lot of people question why I go to metaphysics first. This is like advanced thinking for a lot of people. For some people, it, tr it sounds trivial and mystical, but this is, I mean, this is how, in a certain sense, Aristotle reacted to elements of Plato's ideology because not everyone, even if you're intelligent otherwise, not everyone has these kind of mental aptitudes that allow you to intuit it. Because what we're talking about is not some kind of speculative abstract space. This is phenomenological analysis. Num when I say that number is built into anything we can, 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 sorry, anything we can conceive, I'm talking about our conception. I'm talking about the mind. All of this is talking in terms of the mind, the one that underlies the many. That is the definitive characteristic of consciousness, the ego, the reality principle, in Carl Jung's terms, is the one factor held in common among all conscious experience. There is this unity. There is this kind of higher syntactic structure that in itself is simple uh, because any difference within it would have to be, in order for us to recognize it, would have to be an object of perception and not the, the one subjectivity. Now Heidegger has critiques of the subject-object distinction. And to be honest, I'm not sure if it's not simply choosing not to look at certain facets of phenomenological examination and, and to focus rather on those which aesthetically have a draw or appeal for him. But I'm not a Heidegger scholar, and so I'll leave that as an open question. Maybe after we get through every other era of philosophy, we can begin to consider this, but starting at the end is just not the way to do it, in my opinion. There's, when you go about setting up a philosophy, it's like you're constructing any other kind of system that you might happen to want to build, such as you want to make a pot. That's a system. You're making a clay pot and you have five hours to do this. And so you feel a sense of urgency. I'm, I need to make the best pot possible because you're a, one potter among many that are looking to sell your wares in the market. And maybe there's only one buyer, right? Ultimately, it's a winner takes all kind of scenario, zero sum game. So uh, you have to make a great pot. Well, some people would say, I'm gonna take all five hours and make the best pot I've ever made. But what if this is the first pot you've ever made? <laughs> like that's kind of the scenario with, with many of us in terms of philosophy and, 
ideology building. Um, so what if this is the, the only pot you're ever gonna make? And now would that person who's just making one pot as best as they can, if it's their first try, are they going to come to a sound product? Or is the person who is also never made a pot before, they have five hours and they say, I'm gonna make a hundred pots in these five hours. And in this repetitive process, I'm going to understand the essence of a pot. I'm going to uh, capture the praxis that I need to use to ensure that the product is sound. And what do you think this person's hundredth pot will look like? In all likelihood, even if they only spent 20 minutes on it in the end, it will be better than the one that the person labored over as the one and only. And so, my video cut out and I talked for a bit more after that, but you last heard me talking about the pots. So uh, <laughs> that just demonstrates essentially what I would take to be God's praxis, which is not to set up one perfect and eternal logical system, logical order, logos, uh, and leave it at that. It would rather be to create absolutely everything which appears as chaos, but out of which uh, simultaneously from the beginning occurs this Logos as a natural consequence. So it's not that you, you know, labor over one perfect system, but that you instead create over and over and over and learn the praxis of creation and out of that ar arises this mastery. And so the lo Logos would be the mastery arising out of creation mastery arising out of creation and so we're looking to resonate with that logos now I could e extrapolate my metaphysical precepts a bit further and say uh, coinciding in part with what you know Hegel ended up thinking that this this refinement of symmetry beauty truth goodness the moving towards that axis of things which is able to encapsulate the rest. That's a characteristic of the higher. It's able to subsume the lower, to model the lower. The lower cannot understand the higher. The higher can understand the lower. And so to embody that may result in a state of consciousness, which surpasses individual consciousness, which breaks through to the other side and becomes identical with the original principle, the totality, the infinity, but in a conscious and knowing way. So you could look at the two aspects of the one, uh, you know, unlimited as being the unlimited in terms of uh, just raw generation unconsciously, and then the unlimited in terms of the all-powerful omnipotent Godhead, which is the telos of existence and the cause of existence, first cause and last effect as a, uh, Pythagoras, uh, what's his name? I'm talking about a YouTuber now. I forget his, his handle. Uh, I've talked to him uh, through messages just a little bit, but he made a video about that. Kind of a, a different conception than what I just articulated, but a similar enough one. So we want to harmonize with that Logos. We recognize the basic principles to be out of necessity that there is a necessary being, uh, just the way that reality must be. This is what our reason leads us to. If we don't accept that, then we're just trapped in chaos. And ultimately, all everything we do is reduced to pragmatism and uncertainty. And I mean, at that level, do we have the epistemic ground to say that the, the first principle unlimited of reality is a necessary being? Do we ha do, can we really ground that? I hope so. I'm not sure. You know, it seems like an intuition that I can grasp. The arguments all make sense to me, but I've made sense of arguments that were nonsensical in the past. So it could be happening this time too. I'm just, we're, we're human fallible, but we have a choice of believing, of having faith that there is a truth or renouncing it and 
acting pragmatically in terms of the interests that we understand, and those interests can have no ultimate basis because we never know their ultimate context. Okay, so I'm gonna have to end this because it cut out again. We can never know their ultimate context. So we're left with a choice, believing, having faith in truth or abandoning it and serving our own interests and not believing that they can have an ultimate ground. So, um, yeah, if you want to follow truth, you want to do so within a praxis, a way of life, a mode of conduct, and that's necessarily including how you live with others. And that's where we are, right? So if you want to live with others well, you have to talk to others well and set up an effective communication network. If you want to participate in that, send me your email on Discord. Thank you for listening.